Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part three of our lessons in leadership. And this will be the final part. And as I mentioned, we've had so many great speakers, I probably will have to come back and do uh, the people I left out. We're going to end up doing probably about 10 or 11 people out of 30, so there's a lot to follow. So Marissa Freeman really spoke about brand name. For each enterprise or institution, the name is attached to the value of the brand. And she made the point that that brand helps attract customers and the best staff and allows you to be successful. But just as a good name can work wonders, a bad name once you're, can really hurt you. Once your brand experience is established and equity accrued, you need to protect the equity. If your institution were a chain of, five ho of fine hotels like the Four Seasons, what would happen to the brand if one of the properties did not provide the same level of service? Or if the hotel you always stayed in suddenly began to erode, what would your opinion of the entire chain be? You wouldn't recommend them any longer. Consistency and quality is the key across the organization. Perception is crucial. Healthcare facilities can positively affect patients' perceptions by ameliorating the experience surrounding the delivery of healthcare itself. A relative of mine recounts the experience of undergoing a thyroidectomy at Sloan Kettering. The family waited in a beautiful appointed waiting room, could easily have contacted, uh, been contacted using a sensor device, were able to monitor and follow the journey of their loved one on a monitor. This was not only comforting for the family, but just as importantly, gave them a sense that the facility was indeed state of the art. The kinds of people who work in your company matter. Every speaker said the same thing. You want happy, empathetic people and you want to keep them that way. Create an environment that fosters the type of personality that peer employees participate in the process. Have potential hires interviewed by their peers so the entire team is invested. Don't have one person do the hiring. You want, we have like seven or eight people interview. It's important that everyone interviews from different perspectives. Employees should understand that they're the ambassadors of your brand. In your institution, your patients are bound to have many act interactions with various employees be besides you. You want a good experience. Dirty chairs in the waiting room, perceived rudeness of some staff members is going to hurt you. Through social media, negative perceptions can be spread to large audiences, adversely affecting your brand. A brand does not live inside the walls of the company. It lives in the hearts and minds of your patients, your employees, and your community. For your patients, your brand is in their hands because their life is in your hands. That's an amazing, amazing quote. Remember that the radiology personnel in the front desk and the techs, they are really the face of radiology. You can't have great state-of-the-art equipment with a bad layout. You can't have bad communications. You can't have bad front desk people and bad chairs in the waiting room. Everything matters. Following that, Keith Grossman, who actually is coming to us in January 2019 for a second visit, Keith is amazing and his vision of management becomes very critical. He also speaks a lot about change, that change is very difficult, particularly in the business world. However, you really need to know that, as Winston Churchill once said, that difficulties mastered or opportunities won. There's a challenge running a business that's currently successful because it's easy to make changes if your company's failing. If you're a GE right now, it's easy to make changes because they're under the gun. But if you're very successful, if you're a Google, it's harder to make changes because why should you? Things are going so well. Specifically, the current customers of a successful business are usually happy with the services they're receiving and are unlikely to perceive or understand changes in the marketplace that may be coming in the future and are unlikely to be happy with any changes brought about. So this is something that Jensen Wang also speaks about, is your best customers don't want change, only want minimal change. And so often you don't change because you have happy customers. But on the other hand, if you don't move forward, if you're standing still new entrance into the market, unencumbered by the expectations, 
can make dramatic changes and then people realize what you can do and then they'll drop you like a hot potato and go to someone else. So you need to be maintaining quality but moving forward. As people are running businesses, you have to figure out whether you want to be actively engaged at the center of the fight or simply a bystander. Although there may be some first mover advantages in select cases, it's not always critical or even preferable that you be a leader in driving change within your industry. And sometimes staying on the sidelines and seeing where things going might be preferable. Other times you need to be out in front. Being a leader in time of change requires a North Star. And this is something that Bill Brody also spoke about. You need to have some sort of North Star that you are honest, that you're going to maintain the quality. He's at Blumberg. Blumberg knows what's right. Every decision you make should bring you closer to that North Star. Once you make a decision, have the courage to own the decision. Be confident and knowledgeable. Be able to articulate your message. Although being confident in your decision is important, continually stress testing the reality of your decisions and be prepared to change course if things are not working. Keith's talk was particularly important with his stressing the idea of making changes, sometimes ignoring the short-term complaints of your customers who like things the way they are. Sometimes we need to change to do the right thing. Again, you need to try to bring your customers along. You need to maintain communications. Some physicians still like faxes, but for God's sake, faxes have so many problems. They need to get on the computer. Get over it. Okay, we need to drive them, but we need to do it in a way that brings them along. Jenny Abramson runs the largest women-owned, women-guided venture capital company in the world, and she develops amazing companies. The companies have to be run by women or have senior management that has a lot of women. But remember, she's also taking investors' money. She needs to be successful. Her point is that when you have women involved, you're going to do better. The success of gender diverse teams isn't just true in companies, but also on boards. When there's higher representation of women on the boards, companies have more meetings, higher attendance, experience greater participation, decision making, engage in tougher monitoring, and are more likely to replace the CEO when the stock performs poorly. When you combine this concept of pattern recognition, now she makes the point that one of the challenges that women aren't on boards because they've never been on boards and so you replace the person you have with the person you had before. Um, and the same thing with venture, you know, you kind of have invested and you have a feel of what works and maybe it's the guy wearing a sweatshirt and women often don't wear sweatshirts. So they, they don't seem to be the next big thing. On the other hand, with 70% of consumer spending decisions made by women, and even higher when it comes to healthcare, and two thirds of wealth in the US being controlled by women by 2030, if you don't have women participating in strategy and product decision making, one could argue that you're leaving money on the table. Although these data and experience are clearly focused on venture capital and business, many of these findings apply to other sectors, including healthcare and radiology. Whereas in venture capital, pattern recognition may be both the key to success and a significant risk. Jenny goes on to say that in terms of diversity, specifically gender diversity, our profession lags behind other medical specialties. An ACR survey in 2014 said that only 22% of women were radiologists, or only 22% of radiologists were women, and that had not changed much. Now the good news is that's increasing, but also there's a challenge even mentioned at RSNA 2018 that women are not going into academics. We need to create a workplace that is attractive to women uh, and that's a major step forward in the recruiting process. If we can recruit and retain a more diverse workforce, we will be rewarded with more successful departments with greater ability to re re realize our full potential. So this diversity is not just diversity for diversity's sake. I think Jenny has spoken about that many times. Just to be, to say you have five women and three African Americans and two people of this orientation or that orientation, that's not really the point. You want diversity because in diversity you can do things better and your company will be more successful. Now, Elias Zahuni was here about a year ago. Elias was a resident at Hopkins, 
was the chair at Hopkins, was the head of the NIH, and the head of research at Santa Fe Adventist. So he's been in private practice, he's been in academics, he's been in government, and he's been in the business world. And he spoke about his strange journey and its lessons. And his point was to be successful, you need curiosity and the willingness to reach out to people from other disciplines who know things that we do not know and are smarter than us. He spoke about something he always speaks about, which is very important that I learned a lot from it, the 50-50 rule, that you need to read things outside your field. You can't only be reading in radiology. You need to be reading outside of radiology. Leadership requires heart, spine, and brains as well as dominating one's fear. When I first came to the U.S., I had big dreams. I knew I could not put a full life in a small dream box. The ability of this country to attract the best is what makes America great. For radiology to flourish in the world of precision medicine, we must reach out and collaborate with other disciplines. Remaining sheltered in imaging could hamper success. For example, the development of deep learning as applied to medical imaging depends on radiologists working with computer scientists to identify the most promising applications and algorithms, as well as with our colleagues in oncology and pathology and surgery to identify the key questions we need to address. And Elias made the point that again, you need to cast a wide net to be able to bring people together. Bill Brody also spoke about similar things, but focused more about leadership and making mistakes. And his thing was, again, going back to Keith's North Star, management is about doing things right, where leadership is about doing the right thing. And he said that leadership is a vague term, but is readily apparent to everyone when it's absent. There comes a time when there is a true test for an organization, and you then know who is the true leader. Leadership styles vary from Attila to Hun to Gandhi, but each time can each type can be successful or fail depending on the individual environment. When Apple was failing, they did not need consensus. They needed Steve Jobs saying, this is how you do it. Peter Drucker once said that the most charismatic leaders in the 20th century were Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. Their problem was not bad charisma, it was a bad mission. Again, uh, Dr. Brody spoke about that his experience have taught me one lesson. Never hire second best. If you can't find the optimal candidate, just start the search over. He also made the point that listening to people is critical. Just don't make quick decisions. He spoke about how he quickly realized that he needed to be the last person to speak at a meeting rather than the first. An effective leader needs to hear both sides of an issue before making a proper decision. He mentioned, of course, that as a manager, you're always the last person to know about major problems. And you may f not find the truth. Ed Cadmill spoke about that, that there's more truth in the hallway than the meeting room. You're gonna have problems. Listen to what people tell you, but also try to understand why they're telling you and get better insights by listening to many people. Finding out the truth is not easy. The collective wisdom of crowds may not always be correct. And sometimes you have to trust your gut that the advice you receive may not be the right advice, that you need to listen to people who work for you, but at the end of the day, you need to be thinking and making the right decisions. But remember that leaders are ultimately fired not by their bosses, by the people, rather than by the people who work below them. The perfect leader is a person who is needed by the company more than he or she needs the company's job. Be willing to make unpopular decisions that might even cost you your job if it's the right thing to do. Bill spoke about having the integrity to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences are, and that's what ultimately differentiates the best of leaders. At times, you may not look good, but doing the right thing may not make you look good. Ed Camel, who's now stepping down as the head of Disney and Pixar after 40 years, spoke about the lessons he learned, and his lessons were amazing. He wrote a book called Creativity, Inc. You gotta read the book, but let me tell you a few points. Some of the things he learned that dumb things are happening all the time in organizations, you just don't recognize them early. And he made the point that it's a problem. The higher you get in the organization, 
you see fewer of the problems, and the interconnections and relationships in a big company are so numerous and complex that no leader can completely understand and grasp them. Having an organization in which everyone feels empowered to suggest ideas and make contributions is critical if you, help, if you hope to innovate. Everyone needs to be part of decision making. Now, of course, it doesn't always come out the way you want to. Um, I established, he mentioned, an open door policy. I was told that the production staff had felt hesitant to voice their concerns because it did, they didn't want to seem like they were going over the head of their co-workers. From that time on, I pushed that at Pixar, anyone can voice an opinion to anyone else without worrying about consequences or reprimand. Cadmel mentioned about the hidden aspects of an organization. Radiologists may have a good sense of what's happening in their department reading rooms, as that's where we work. However, we may not know what's happening in other parts. What's happening at the appointment office, the parking, the receptionist? Do you have a bad IV starter? Can you not get the results of a study? Those things don't seem to be on top of our list, but they are critical in the patient experience. Ed also spoke about candor, that it's dangerous when everyone in a meeting is afraid to speak up and voice their concerns, but once the meeting is over, they talk to one another in private about the real issues. Real concerns need to be addressed and corrected early before they become huge and costly. As a leader, it's essential to surround yourself with people who are honest and unafraid to disagree with you. If there is more truth in the hallways than in the meeting room, you're going to have a real problem. And finally, Jensen Wang. Jensen Wang is the amazing founder and leader and CEO of NVIDIA, which is the leader in AI. And he made several points, and I think he is, you got to read the article, okay? But it's a good closing. <clears throat> he made four points, four critical things. Do work that matters, that is hard, that we're uniquely able to do. Make sure the problem you're working on matters to other people and is thus commercially viable work that can be funded. Remember, however, that unless you swing for the fences, your company will almost certainly lose. If you don't take risks in business, how can you hope to beat all those other incredible companies in the marketplace? The conservative move is often the one that will put you out of business. Aim high. Do great projects. Number two, do work that brings us incredible joy. Realize that profits may not be there when you start. Use the pride and satisfaction of your work itself as a way to overcome those inevitable initial setbacks and obstacles. Number three, believe in your vision, knowing that your best customers may not at first. Something that Keith spoke about, Keith Grossman spoke about before. It is a truism that several of our most successful innovations were products that consumers claim to have no interest in prior to our developing them. Success as an innovator sometimes requires the foresight to see ahead of the customer's current wants and desires. Remember, Henry Ford said that if he asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. He wanted to build a car, they wanted a faster horse. Although Jensen Wang's development of a multi-billion dollar, $150 billion company may seem light years away from the demands of running a radiology practice. His advice of taking joy in your work and care about craftsmanship is valid in any industry. It's easy to mail it in and provide a mediocre product, but that's just not gonna work. Many radiology practices, just like in Silicon Valley, have encountered failure because they have failed to realize that it's quality work that underpins financial success. So I've now gone through about 11 or 12 speakers and I have 18 more to do, but that's gonna be a story for another day. But you can see that each of the speakers did not compare notes, but their rules, quality, hiring, vision, leadership, honesty, integrity are all themes that go through every one of our speakers. And I hope that you've learned something from this talk. Read the articles in JACR, you will enjoy them. And to next, until next time, have a great day.